we have uh, our, our grandchildren with us. Uh, uh, Bryce and Bethany's uh, children are here for a week, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And, um, and uh, so it was so good yesterday, we went to the ice cream shop twice. And uh, so it was, it was a lot of fun. My other daughter was, came up as well, and she brought her uh, three offspring, um, monkey see, monkey do, or something, I don't know, anyway. Uh, but anyway, it, we had, we, we've been having a good time, and I needed the rest, so I came to church. Um, thank you for coming to church today. I, I'm going to give you a word I've never given to any church before, and um, just simply entitled, The Gates of Hell Will Not Prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail. And of course, you know the, the reference you've heard this reference preached on many, many times. And it comes, of course, from the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And uh, I don't know where Pastor is today. Uh, I assume it has something to do with golf. Um, but, um, you know, thank God. Stand behind your leaders. Stand behind your pastors. Pray for them. They need the prayer and you need the practice. And so it's a good combination. So pray for them. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He was declaring he is deity, and he was the expected one to come. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, Petros, the little stone, and on this rock I will build my church. The rock about which he spoke is Petra, which is the bedrock. So you're the little stone upon which the truth established on the bedrock. I will build my church and the gates of Hades, interpret it to say hell, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he ordered them not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. We are in an era of great challenge. That which we only heard about in other places, places of the world that I've traveled and been, we've heard about these things, are now affecting the North American church. As some of you know, I spent the last 30 years here in the United States, but previous to that I lived in, was raised in Canada. And I cannot tell you how far the Canadian culture has moved away from where it was 30 years ago when I was there. There's little to cheer about in our current culture. We are exposed to levels of evil that heretofore we've never knew existed. My daughter, who you know, some of you know is an FBI agent, she says to me, I, I did not realize the depth of depravity that was out there. Didn't know there was such a level of of human corruption. I mean, there is violence. I mean, just think about it for a second. Somebody's walking on a, on, a, on, a, on a subway platform and somebody else just comes up and cold clocks some woman that could be my mother or your sister or your daughter or pushes them in front of a church. What, what possesses people? I can tell you what possesses people. It's, it's demonic, but what causes people to, to behave that way? There are addictions to all kinds of, 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 of things, and of course we think of drugs and alcohol, but there's all kinds of addictions that are out there. There's illegalities going on, there's corruption in government, there's murder, and there's mayhem. It's people who take the First Amendment right and turn it into what they perceive as a right to protest and burn and, and riot and loot. There's unimaginable political polarization, you know. And by the way, you all realize that you're right and, and the other guy's wrong. You realize that, right? Yeah. And by the way, they're all saying the same thing about us. 
And of course, there's a breakdown in moral order, a sense of what is appropriate, what is right, what is good, what is, what is in fact helpful to a society, a civil society. There's wars and international tensions. There is gender dysphoria and sexual deviation. And I, I, I debated yesterday as I thought about this, should I go off on gender dysphoria? Should I go, and, and, and I could go off on any one of these things. Can I just tell you that, well, it seems like this whole deal of gender dysphoria appears to be relatively new, right? I mean, even five years ago, we weren't talking about some of the stuff we're talking about now. But 3,500 years ago, when Moses wrote the Pentateuch, or when he wrote the, the law he received from the Lord, one of the portions of the law said it's, it's not right for a man to wear women's clothing. They were struggling, it's not right for a woman to wear a man's clothing. And they were struggling with gender dysphoria 3,500 years ago. It's as old as mankind. And by the way, just because I feel a certain way doesn't mean I am. I feel thin. <laughs> and it was really insensitive of you to laugh like that. I am going to have to work with a therapist now for probably months to get over this. I feel tall. I feel young. I feel like my, ch my grandchildren all behave. I, I could have felt, and my brothers tried to make me feel like I was adopted. I could have felt maybe a little strange. But you know what? Sometimes I have to tell myself that is not who you are. And to call, by the way, it a gender-affirming surgery. It is not gender-affirming surgery. It is actually gender-disaffirming surgery. It disaffirms what already is in existence. It actually says, you're not what you were created to be. We'll create you into something else that you were never intended to be. Now, let me make very, very clear. Those who affirm this kind of stuff, for the most part, some realize it's, 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 it's out there, but... Many, many affirm it because they actually have a deep seated You see, the scripture says in Romans, thinking they were wise, they became as fools. And so we have to be very, very careful that we don't become arrogant and, 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 and critical. But on the other hand, we have to stand for truth and do that in the most loving and gentle way possible. Now, I'm going to moderate this in a bit, but I just want to share with you and please understand that in an image of God, he created them, male and female. And he didn't give us 65 options. I feel so much better. Thank you for allowing me to vent. There's an anti-God, and, and this is a statement I wish I had time to spend a little more time on, but this is, there's an anti-God hatred leading to a death cult. Every time, you, every time you, 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 you hate God, you begin what we call a death cult. What is abortion? What is, what is euthanasia? You know, that now in, in some places now they're allowing children to decide from tw under 12 years old in some countries. You think of the Netherlands. In, 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 and they're allowing children to decide whether or not they want to continue to live based on a set of criteria that may, they may feel like, hey, my life is not worth living, therefore I can, I can opt out. And it's euth euthanasia. So an anti-God hatred leading to a death cult that is leading to an anti-humanity orientation. Do you realize that some of the things that we're now embracing are self-destructive? We are actually eating ourselves alive. A total lack of awareness and acquiescence to the will of a sovereign God who claims rightful ownership of the world and all the people in it. 
Do you know there is a sovereign God who claims rightful ownership of my life? The reason you serve the Lord, the reason I serve the Lord, yes, there are benefits, and yes, we're going to heaven, and yes, I'm not going somewhere else later on. I'm going to spend my eternity in the presence of Jesus. Yes, that's all true, but ultimately the number one reason you serve Jesus Christ is because Jesus Christ alone is worthy to be saved, served rather, and he is the one alone to whom I owe my life and my allegiance. That's why I serve Jesus. It's not for what I'm going to get. It's because of who he is. And of course, to put it succinctly, the world is not for us. It's not for you. They're not backing you. The media, by the way, is not for you and your family. I don't know if you've noticed that. Even your so-called conservative media. I've watched how they have morphed and began to accept things they wouldn't have accepted 15 years ago, but now they morphed since the Soji decision. Remember the Soji sexual orientation and gender identification decision made by the Supreme Court. You, you, you understand that the media morphed and changed, even conservative media did. Our educationist system appears to be antithetic to God's word and will and to biblical order. There is a systematic, or rather a systemic bias against all that is holy and God-honoring. That which is good is called evil, and that which is evil is now called good. Do you realize that you are the ones that we're afraid of now because you have standards and you have belief systems that are totally contrary to the, to the standards of the culture? And we have to be careful with you. Now, I, I was careful with some of you to begin with, but now we have to be really careful with you. Hollywood and entertainment and the entertainment industry is not on your side. Listen to me, parents, and listen to me, grandparents. Hollywood and the entertainment industry is not on your side. They're not there to lead your kids closer to Jesus. They're not there to try to, to, try to create a sense in which there's a sovereign God in their life. Listen to me and understand this. Some of your kids know more about Elsa and know more about Frozen and, and all that other stuff than they know about Jesus Christ. It's time to turn off the tablets, turn off the TV, and it's time to bring them into the presence of the Lord and teach them God's holy word and believe God that he will change their orientation. Stop babysitting your kids in front of a device and bring them into the presence of a living God. Churches and Christians no longer enjoy having the culture's positive covering. We don't have home field advantage anymore. You know, when they say, well, it's a church, we'll, we'll allow for that. It's, you know, no, it's a church, we understand that. I, I, I actually recall a day, even since I've been in the United States, where you, the, the teachers did not give homework in the South on a Wednesday evening. Why is not? Because it was assumed that kids were going to be at youth group that night. Now, one of the benefits of being older, I'm told, is that you have perspective. I remember the things that many are saying today about the condition of the world when I was young. So, so you know, I grew up in the days of the hippies. I was not one, because I, I bathed. But um, I, I remember those days. And I remember people wringing their hands saying, wow, has the world ever messed up? And, how, and, and, and by the way, they could have made a list like I just made and, and, and talked about how we were, we were kind of all going to hell in a handbasket back then too. Remember that? And, and if you were to go to generation before that, I, I remember my, my mother and father, who are both with the Lord now, but I remember them both saying, you know, they didn't expect to die. They expected to be with Jesus because how could Jesus hold off his second coming if the world was in such a corrupt mess? These things were being said as well at the time of the Azusa Street Revival, 1906 to 1909. And uh, you can read about them in, in what's called the Apostolic Faith Papers that came out of the revival. There's always been an appropriate sense that the church and God's agenda is being opposed by forces of evil and mayhem. But we know that almost every generation of believers have felt the way that I just described to you that we are feeling when I made that rather regrettable list. And this should not be a surprise to us. Listen to what the scripture says. But mark this. This is what the Apostle Paul says. Mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days, written 2,000 years ago. 
People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. Now that you're all depressed, <laughs> let's see if we can bring some perspective. In the midst of what the scriptures that we read earlier from Matthew chapter 16, there are two key questions that are asked. Who do men or who do others say that I am? And the second question is, who do you as a Christ follower say I am? The world's hope in the midst of our groaning and our trouble is the church. The world's hope in the midst of our groaning and in the midst of our trouble is the, is the church of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that you are the hope of the world? Transformation Church and other churches that are meeting, and when you meet tonight and you meet with all these other believers, this is the, hurt, this is the, this is the hope of Altoona. This is the hope of Blair County. This is the hope of our state. This is the hope of our nation. This is the hope of our world. The church of Jesus Christ is the hope that we bring from the, from the, from the throne room of heaven to the world around us. And here's what we know. Jesus' followers who know who he is and what our divine prerogatives are in the face of seemingly unmitigated evil. Did you notice I just said, I didn't say in the face of unmitigated evil, I said seemingly in the face of unmitigated evil. Because in the face of evil, we have the church of Jesus Christ who is the divine restrainer before everything falls apart eschatologically, or if you want to talk about the end times, you can talk about you know, how it's all going to end, and there's all kinds of debate, and I'm not an eschatologian. I, I don't do well with discussing biblical prophecy of end times. I, I, I don't know. I'm just, my wife hasn't told me what to think yet about that. <laughs> but I will tell you this. We do know that there will come a time when the eastern sky will be broken and Jesus will come again and he's coming for a bride that's without spot or wrinkle well, who is us but in the meantime we're the restraining force in the world against unmitigated evil we stand for righteousness we stand for justice we stand for peace we stand for wholeness we stand for deliverance we stand for salvation we stand for healing of the body we stand for 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 the touch of God we stand for God with us Emmanuel dwelling among us we stand for that that's who we are we are the church of Jesus Christ and we are the hope of the world we're the hope of the world but in order to understand the what and the why of this story, you have to understand to whom Jesus was speaking and when and where. Who? The scripture says he asked his disciples. He was not speaking to the crowd at this point. He was speaking to very few. Some debate whether it was the disciples in a, in a grand scheme, like maybe several hundred, or whether he was just speaking to the twelve. It is likely he was just speaking to the twelve. But to those who were destined, these were the, he wasn't speaking to the crowd, he was speaking to those destined to be loyal and effective, his disciples, to whom he was entrusting his legacy and the holy potency of his message. Listen to that, the holy potency of his message. They belonged to him, these disciples, and to them he entrusted the secrets and the keys to the direction of the, of the remainder of his life and the future of the world when he would be absent from them physically, but he said, I'm going to send the comforter who's going to come and he's going to make my presence real and he's gonna, it's going to be a, uh, an impermeable presence of God everywhere all the time because Holy Spirit has come. Well, when? When? It was at a time when his preaching and teaching emphasis was about to change. Up to this point, Jesus had been preaching the kingdom. You read in Matthew, it's a, it was a kingdom of heaven, and Matthew did not use the term God. Other, other gospel writers used the kingdom of God. Matthew didn't use it that way. He used it kingdom of heaven, and they are synonymous statements in, 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 in the gospels. 
so Matthew preached the kingdom of heaven slash God, and he preached it, and he, and he told us all about it, and he, and he just constantly emphasized by Jesus the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. But then the scripture says that Jesus actually changed his preaching emphasis at this point. It is the verse we didn't read. It is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. He changed his preaching emphasis from kingdom to his destiny here on earth. Hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to give my life a ransom for many. He changes his preaching emphasis. So we have the who, it was to the disciples, not the World Health Organization or the rock band to which some of you were allied in your youth. We have the when, it was at this point when he was going to change his preaching emphasis to talk about the cross. But what about the where? The scripture says he spoke to those in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea, obviously named after Caesar. Philippi was a local leader. And he named it after himself, but put Caesar's name in front. But this particular locality had a long history of changed names, but it was the same locality. And Jesus was illustrative in, in, in his activities. He used his activities not just happenstancely, but he brought his activities to a point so that he could bring further understanding to those. So he chose Caesarea Caesarea. He chose that city. <laughs> he chose that city because he wanted to illustrate something that would be powerful that would powerfully impact those disciples. He wanted to give them a divine principle, a sacred fact, a supernatural possibility. To say that they were in this city is to say that they were in one of the worst places possible. It was a place that the religious never went because of its evil associations. In Old Testament time, Caesarea Philippi, then known as Benaeus, sat at the base of Mount Hermon. Early Canaanites worshipped Baal at Benaeus. And prisoners were thrown into, quote-unquote, the gates of hell. So what was going on is that it had a huge cave. And the mouth of the cave in that city spewed out water because there were seven very, very virulent and, 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 and uh, effective um, uh, wellsprings that came out of that cave. And, and, and they were amazing. They were almost like geysers, and they came out in full force. And so out of the mouth of that cave came this river of water. Now, if you were to go there today, you wouldn't see that because, number one, there's been earthquakes, and number two, they've, they need the water, and they've redirected it. But back then, it came gushing out of that cave and made such a, a tumultuous, um, of, of, of water activity that, that they could never ever get down to the bottom of it because it was so, you, you, you know, you couldn't swim down, you couldn't go down. So they saw it as something that was bottomless. So they saw it as woebegone and almost evil. And so the water's gushing out, it is thrashing and, 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 and it's gyrating. And, and so what they would do is they'd offer sacrifices to Baal and other gods, and, and in particular goats, and once they were done, they'd throw them into this water. Well, what would happen is the water would splash back and forth against the waves or against the walls that contained that water, and those beasts that had just been sacrificed would be mashed up and broken up, and they'd just become basically um, minced up in that water. Well, they actually used it as well as a place where they would judge people who were accused of crimes. And they would say, well, we're not really sure you're, you're guilty of the crime, but we'll test you and see. We'll throw you into, the, into this water that was gushing out from this cave, fed by seven uh, springs of water. And if you survive, I guess you're not guilty. It's a kind of a bizarre sense. It wasn't, well, no one ever survived. And their bodies were just mashed up into little pieces as they were beat against the sides of the walls as they came out of that tumultuous cave. 
Those were the gates of hell. And the people in the neighborhood referred to it as the gates of hell. It was called the gates of hell. Fast moving, it propelled the bodies over the rocks and the death was guaranteed. The water was filled with human and animal corpses. What a frightening sight. To the ancient Greeks who settled in the area of the cave at Caesarea Philippi was the gate to the underworld. There were fertility gods dwelt in the winter and then returned to the earth each spring. The people who believed the cave held the very doorway into the abyss, into Hades and hell itself. That's the where. And Jesus brings his disciples there to talk to them about some spiritual and scriptural principles that would guide them in their ministry and it should have an effect on us today. So what is the what and the, what is the why? We have the who, it is the, it is the disciples. We have the, 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 the when, it's at the time his preaching emphasis began to emphasize the cross. Now we have the where, it is in the gates of hell, which, which they call literally the gates of hell. Jesus brings them to this demonic location and, and begins to illustrate to them that the gates of hell, which are so woe begone, which are so powerful, which are so overwhelming, which are so horrendous, the gates of hell, which, which are to be feared, and people are running from the gates of hell. Whatever you do, don't go near the gates of hell. That's the place where Jesus brought his disciples and then tells them they have power to deal with the gates of hell. They have power to destroy and come against the gates of hell. In response to the second question, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Now, let me just say this. The world has a distorted view of Jesus. They saw Jesus as possibly Jeremiah or Elijah coming back, and within their culture that seemed reasonable, but it wasn't who Jesus was. Simon Peter says, no, no, you're the Messiah the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah, that is the expected one. Understand this, the Messiah was expected. How many of us are expecting the Messiah? <laughs> he was to be expected. He's saying, he's the one we've been waiting for, Peter's saying. But not only that, this Messiah for whom we've been waiting is the Son of the living God. And when you say in scripturally the Son of the living God, what that actually means is he is in fact God the Son. He is God the Son. He is the Son of God, but he's also deity himself. You can look at it in, Matthew, in John chapter 5 and verse 18. It says they sought all the more to kill him because he claimed to be the Son of God, making himself what? Equal with God. There's a declaration that Jesus, by saying he was the Son of God, was declaring himself to be God. Peter was declaring him to be God as well when he's saying he is the Messiah, the expected one, and he is the Son of God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, the gates of Hades, <laughs> the gates of hell, what you're looking at right now will not overcome it. I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter says he's the Messiah. And he was a hero. He, has, he was not a happenstance historic, historical phenomenon. In their culture, they expected someone to come and set them free from Roman or, or political domination. Jesus did not meet their expectations, but they rejected him. Long after Jesus physically left this life, John said this in John, 11, John 1, verses 11 to 13, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. He was rejected. He was not accepted as the, as, the, as the Messiah, as the solution to their problems. He was rejected. His own did not receive him. Yet, 
to all who do receive him. To them he gives the right, the power, the authority to become the children of the Most High God. It's one of the first verses of Scripture I learned as a child. Mr. Wilson was my Sunday school teacher. And after I graduated from the class, the Lord in mercy took Brother Wilson to himself as a reward for having me in his class. <laughs> Jesus says this came to Peter by what? By divine revelation. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by whom? Flesh and blood. No, it was revealed by my Father. Where? In heaven. There was a divine revelation of this. You wouldn't have been able to get this on your own. You're a little slow on the draw, Peter. This came from heaven. Can I submit to you that all of your social media posts, all of your political meanderings, all of your, you know, your discussions on this and that and transgenderism, whatever it is you want to talk about, being woke and all that, all of that will never ever draw somebody to Jesus. What will draw somebody to Jesus is when they have a divine revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. We cannot do without the supernatural now, friends. This is more than just us having social relationships and we kind of give people some information. This is not information now. It is a revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. And when people have a revelation, it changes changes them for time and for eternity. We need divine revelation. We need Jesus to come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, reveal yourself. Holy Spirit, show my children. Show my grandchildren. Holy Spirit, invade them with a, a sense of the divine in Jesus' name. Understand that we, this is not optional. I remember one time I was on a plane and and there was this guy sitting beside me. And so I started to tell him about Jesus. And he nodded. And then I took out a track and I went through the track with him. And he read the scriptures. You always get the people to read the scriptures because you want them to have the experience of the word. And he read the scriptures in the track and I read the, the text and he read scriptures and I read the text. And then it came to the end and it said, would you like to give your life to Jesus? And I said, would you like to give your life to Jesus? He said, yes. And so then we prayed, and we gave your life to Jesus, and he got off that plane as unsaved as he got on. You say, how do you know that? He didn't have any revelation. I was transferring information. There was nothing there. I'd like to be able to tell you, listen, he got off that plane, became an evangelist, and we'll be here next week. <laughs> Believers... Understand that we no longer have home field advantage. People do not culturally believe in Jesus. Divine revelation is absolutely necessary. The age of the supernatural is not, a, is, is not past. It is a requisite for today. This is not the time to rest on hoping to convince people about Jesus. It's time to face such an evil of our time that we believe God for supernatural revelation and his rightful claim on their lives. And then what does Jesus say? After the, he has this revel, he affirms that it's a revelation that he now understands. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock, you are Peter, the little rock, the Petros. On this rock, the Petra, the bedrock, the bedrock of the truth of what you're saying, upon the bedrock of the truth, that's where the church will be built. Jesus is still doing stuff through little stones. when they build those stones on bedrock truths. And Jesus says, I will build my church. Church is only mentioned twice in the Gospels. Ecclesia, the Greek word, originally meant a group of called out legislators, an assembly, a group of called out, that's why we call our, this church is affiliated with what? The assemblies of God, we use that term, and lots of churches still use the idea that they're an assembly. That is a, that is a, uh, a, a, a scriptural thing. And so here we have the church being described as an assembly, only mentioned twice here and then in chapter 18. It is his work through us. He says, I will build my church. It is his church. He's building it. Secondly, it will be built. It is not a punctiliar event, but it is a building process. 
It's going to take time. If I say I'm going to build something, it's, I'm not going to snap my fingers and it's going to happen. I'm going to rather go through a process. How many know the church is not yet fully built? We're still building it. Jesus is still building it. It's his church. It's not ours. But he's building a group of people who will serve as legislators. You ever dreamed about being in government? You ever say to yourself, oh boy, oh boy, if I was in, if I was in Washington, I'll tell you what, I, if I was in Harrisburg, I'll tell you, if I was at the government center here in Blair County, I'll tell you, I'd straighten no son of a motherless goat. I'd tell you, I'd straighten. Some of you were worried, I know you were. And some of you go, what do you say, what do you say, what do you say? Don't sleep. I'm a little slow for a while, but then once in a while I say something right off the wall. Okay, maybe not once in a while. But, but you know what? The scripture says you are a legislator. You get to impose the will of our king. Not through human means, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You have the ability to pull strongholds down in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So here's what he says. The gates of hell will what? Not overcome it. In the most debauched environment, he is determined to build something that will last for time and eternity. In the most evil of circumstances, think about whatever it is you're facing. Can it, can it, is it possible in the light of what's going on in society and all the things that we listen, can, can a church still be built? The church is in an offensive position here, according to the Scripture. He, we're not in a defense. We're not behind the gates, kind of holding them down. So, oh, come on. Get. No, we're actually marching against gates. We're actually coming against powers of darkness. We are actually tearing down strongholds in Jesus' name. Think about all the things that you see around you that are not God and not His will. I want you to know if they're not His will, you have authority in Jesus' name. As a group and as an individual, you have an authority to bring to bear powers of God against those very things. Things that never seem to come into divine order. God can bring them in divine order. Why? Because we are the church of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We will be victorious in Jesus' name. And what does he say? He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus does not leave us without keys. It is in a spiritual warfare understanding the holy potency of our message. It's not just a philosophic approach. It's not religion. It is a holy, potent, powerful message. We will never prevail by engaging in culture wars or by living in a bubble and denying reality or by retreating and hoping to hold on till Jesus comes. We prevail by believing in and preaching the gospel and the power of God, not politics, not earthly and fleshly power encounters on social media or in discussions with family and community and workplace. I like having my family come if they'll not speak when they get in my home. <laughs> All you need to say when you get into the home, kids, is the food is good, the temperature is fine. Our air conditioner went out yesterday. It was 80-some degrees yesterday afternoon in the home. And I was laying on the couch having a little nap, and I suddenly awoke and realized that Ruth had stopped fanning me And so we had to have a little discussion, obviously, about that. <laughs> but you know what? You can have all kinds, of, all kinds of, you can win all kinds of arguments politically or socially and never draw people closer to Jesus. All we've done is win an argument. I want people to have a divine revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the what? power of God that brings salvation. It's not the argument of God that brings salvation. It's not the persuasion of God that brings salvation. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So here's the question. What are your gates of hell? Where is evil so prevalent in your life that you desire to run from it or pretend it does not exist? 
Or alternatively, you are so discouraged by the evil that you wonder if you can ever, it'll ever change in favor of God's will. Can it get any better? Oh, well, this is the way it's always been. It'll never change. I could literally preach lots of series, series of messages on each one of these. Number one, we, we are people of prayer. We are able to break powers of darkness as we seek God and we seek heaven. Personal prayer, public prayer. You're doing public prayer tonight. Corporate prayer. You're doing corporate prayer tonight. Invoking the power that's in the name of Jesus. I have been in situations that have been ungodly. And under my breath and sometimes out loud, depending on the context, I have said, in the name of Jesus, I command you. I command you to come into alignment with the Word of God. I had a dream one time not due to too much pizza. And as I was walking along this road, and I was familiar with the road, it was in Canada, and these dogs were just, boom, 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 boom. They were coming, two of them were coming at me. And they were about to jump the fence. And they had the appearance of some of my in-laws. And um, so they were coming at me. And I remember in my dream, I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to stop. This is what was happening in my dream. And they stopped and just kind of withered away and went on their way. A couple of weeks later, I was walking on that very road. Those very dogs I saw in my dream were coming. And they were coming at me. And I remembered my dream. And so in the name of Jesus, I spoke to those dogs. And I said, I command you in Jesus' name to stop. And I threw my chocolate bar in the other direction. No, I didn't. And, and, and they stopped, and they just withered away. Well, if Jesus will do that for a young preacher, he'll do that for us too. He'll do that in that situation. Sometimes it's not appropriate to do it out loud. Sometimes it's appropriate to go in a place by yourself and just you know, proclaim it. Sometimes it's just appropriate to do it under your breath. You have to discern that. But I want you to know there's power in the name of Jesus. Next, there's the preaching of the cross. Not a political agenda, but we invoke the power of the blood of Jesus. Do you realize the cross is the most powerful message ever heard in all of human history? That Jesus died for you. He gave up his life. The perfect one became imperfect. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Another one is we come into biblical agreement with others and we pray together. That's what you're doing tonight. You're coming into biblical agreement with all kinds of other people. That's wonderful. Next, we make prophetic acts of faith and obedience. Prophetic acts of faith and obedience. One of the greatest of this was a man by the name of Count uh, Ludwig von Zinzendorf. If you say it fast, you know that I, I, if I say it real fast, then you'll know, you'll wonder, can he really pronounce it or is he speaking in tongues or whatever. Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf, who was the beginner of the, the man who started the Moravian church. He was born in 1700. He died in 1760. He sent countless numbers of He had an egalitarian view of what the church should be, and he sent countless numbers of missionaries around the world, many of whom became enslaved themselves in order for them to minister to slaves in the new world. Count Zinzendorf says this, you must be convinced, you must be content to suffer, to die, and be forgotten. To suffer, to die, and be forgotten for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a prophetic act that says, I don't need any glory myself. It all goes to him. And he gets all the glory. May he alone be remembered. And finally, prophesying his word into troubled demonic situations. Satan, your stronghold cannot prevail. My family, my workplace, my city, my marriage, my children, my grandchildren, my health, whatever it is, For God's word says that the gates of hell will never prevail against a church that's victorious. That's who you and I are. Who do you as a Christ follower say that Jesus is? The question is, is he big enough? Is he good enough? Is he loving enough to invade your gates of hell? 
with his supernatural ability to build his church. In your dank and deadly and dastardly place, may Jesus reveal himself. May Jesus reveal himself in that situation that you've been in in the last two or three days. Some of you get up this morning and say, I don't even think I can go to church. I'm so discouraged. You're, you're experiencing a gates of hell situation. But I want you to know that you're a part of a group of people and you're a part of a body that Jesus started, that he's perpetuating, that's coming against those very forces of evil. He's bringing deliverance to you and to those about whom you are so concerned. In Jesus' name, I prophesy and I speak over you now. And I say some of you, some of you begin to apprehend what the Spirit of God is about to say. Begin to apprehend it and begin to apply it to your gates of hell. I say to you now, those gates of hell will not prevail against what God is going to do in your situation. He's going to do it one more time. One more time, God, pour out your spirit. One more time, God, deliver. One more time, God, save. One more time, pour out your power and reveal yourself as the God who is God one more time. And the pastor has been so diligent to call on folks who don't know Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you do not have a right relationship with him. You're not in a right relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're here and you've watched it or you listen to the message or something you say, you know, I, I, yeah, I kind of like this, but it's not really, yeah. I don't feel like I'm really a part. Well, it's time for you to join and become a part. And we don't join by signing a card. We don't join by going through a class. We join by getting to know a person. His name is Jesus. The Bible says the heaven is a free gift. You can't earn heaven and you can't deserve heaven. The Bible also says that man is a sinner. He can't save himself. I'm absolutely dastardly evil and I can't save myself that's where God comes in he loves me and yet he hates sin he hates sin and yet he loves me so how does he reconcile those two together he reconciles them through Jesus Christ the scripture says as I've already quoted he who knew no sin became sin that I might become the right so what I did is I took all my sin and gave it to Jesus and it was there was a lot it was so much he took all my sin and he gave me all of his righteousness. We made the great trade. So what do I do? I place my faith in not in what I've done, but in what if he's done. And I say, Jesus, what you've done for me is enough. I give you my life. I give you my life. If that's you today, I'm going to ask you to consider making Jesus Lord of your life. For the rest of us, I'm going to ask you to not consider this as just a teaching and oh, wasn't that sweet and he went a little long and sure glad his wife wasn't here. I'm asking you to take this as a practical lesson in dealing with your own gates of hell. You do not have to tolerate what you're facing. You need to come against it in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. In Jesus' name. Let's stand all over this house. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, all over this room today, many of us have faced gates of hell situations, situations that are overwhelming, situations that we could never have envisioned that we would be in, but we are, or maybe at, in a workplace, or maybe even in, our, in the greater culture over which we feel like we have no ability to influence. I say in Jesus' powerful name, raise up believers in this house who will say we're part of a body, that we're not going to just coexist with evil, not going to just throw up our hands in discouragement. We are going to come against the gates of hell. We're going to come against the gates of hell that are chewing up people, that are bashing up against the walls like, like was taking place in Caesarea Philippi. In the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, I pray, raise up some warriors in this house. Raise up some warriors in this house. Mighty men of women, mighty men and women of valor and of, and of victory, I pray in Jesus' name. How many of you would say to me, all over this room, I've got some gates of hell situations going on. 
I've got some gates in hell situations going on. I saw some of you nodding your head. I thought I didn't know if you were sleeping or agreeing, but hey, I've got some gates of hell stuff. Anybody else? I'm going to give you a chance in the name of Jesus. Now, in the name of Jesus, receive a touch of heaven right now. Come on, receive the touch of heaven. Receive the touch of heaven. And you will receive power when Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you will prevail against the gates of hell. But we ask for those of you who do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you'd like to know him today, this is your chance. How many would kind of raise your hand and wave it back and forth for me so I can see you, so we can have somebody come and pray with you? Hey, I don't know Jesus, but I want to know him today. I'm not in right relationship with God, but I I know I'm going to make him my Savior and Lord today. Anybody here like that? Anybody here? I'm looking on my right, your left, and now I'm scanning. I see that hand way back there. Thank you for waving that hand. And there's another one back there, and I think my friends are going to see that, and they're going to move to them right there. You can see some hands. Can you see them, brother? They're over here. Wave your hand back and forth so they can see you. Thank you. They're going to pray with you. We give God glory. Anybody else? One more time, I'm going to search. Go back and forth. It's your chance. Amen. So how many say there's victory in Jesus? How many say there's victory in Jesus? Come on, I have victory in Jesus. We're going to believe God that you'll have victory. Your gates of hell are being are coming down in Jesus' name. There's salvation, there's deliverance, there's freedom. It's coming down in the name of Jesus. This is your chance. Amen.